the thing about depression is that if you're African American, and especially if you're, if you're an African American church boy, uh, there is a stigma that goes with it. So many people are embarrassed or ashamed, as I was, um, to say anything about it for fear of, of what people may think of you. A lot of times people think that uh, you're possessed. Um, it's a spirit, so let's come and cast this spirit out of you. Uh, I read, uh, I, I was looking on Facebook earlier, uh, I think yesterday actually, and there was a young brother, very young brother, who's a musician, who was talking about his struggle, you know, with depression. I think it's the first time he'd ever really admitted it. And the comments to his post were, pray about it, get somebody to pray for you. Don't get me wrong, prayer is very, very important, but depression is an illness. It's a mental illness, just like hypertension or any other kind of physical uh, illness. Um, for me, uh, I'm not sure when it started. Um, I am an only child. Um, came from a pretty, pretty happy household, very close to my mom. Um, that was my, my rock. My stepfather and I did not have a, a good uh, relationship at all. He was physically abusive to me. And one, and one thing that I found out, you know, as I finally got to therapy, was that sometimes depression is anger turned inward. And uh, I think that that was part of my problem. Because uh, when you're a kid, you don't have anything you can say. You can't retaliate. You certainly can't talk back if you live in a black household. And <laughs> so a lot of things you just had to take. I think, I think my, um, the way that I dealt with it was through music. I went into my room, turned on the record player, or either I went to the piano and played and sang until the pain went away. Uh, and then my grandfather, my mother's father, committed suicide before I was born. Um, and so all of my life, he was a hunter, that was, that was his thing, and he uh, took his shotgun and killed himself. Um, and I never knew him, but from all of the stories that I got, um, all of my life, hearing my mother talk about what a great person he was. Actually, I'm named after him. Um, it seems like he probably uh, fought depression. And of course, way back then, no one knew what depression was, certainly not in the black community, and he just sort of dealt with it. So I think I may have had like a double, <laughs> double dose uh, from my upbringing as well as genetically uh, from my, my grandfather, who's probably in my DNA as well. So um, I'm not exactly sure when it started. Um, my mom always said I was an odd child, and I think that had a lot to do with me being a musician. I think most musicians are, uh, I, have a, I have a sweatshirt that says musicians are weird. And I think that's probably true. I think most creative people are. You know, whether you're a musician or, or artist or dancer or whatever, I think creative people are, are different. We, we, we sort of walk to the beat of a different drum. However, uh, I remember probably around the time, in my late 20s, early 30s, uh, of being very unhappy. And I didn't know why. At the time, I thought the reason was that I had not reached uh, some of the goals that I aspired to. One was to go into music full time, uh, go into music ministry full time, uh, become a recording artist, you know, the whole nine yards. That's what I've always wanted to do since I was five or six years old. I used to stand in front of the mirror when I was a kid and put on records and pretend I was who, whoever that was on the on the recording, singing in front of uh, thousands of people. And um, so I thought because I had not attained that as of yet, my unhappiness was, would go away if that ever happened. And it happened, and God blessed, blessed me in many, many ways that I never imagined 
but the, but the happiness didn't come. Uh, the darkness did not go away. Um, and I think I was in denial. Um, I, in my early years, I didn't know what depression was. Um, but I knew something was wrong, and I didn't really know what to do. I didn't want to tell anybody about it. I didn't want to talk about it. And so I dealt with it for years, years of, of uh, sometimes not coming out the house, um, just being in a very dark place. I, I, I dealt with years of anxiety, uh, social anxiety, even anxiety in terms of talking on the phone. Um, and I still have that. I hate the phone. But I'll text you all day long, but don't call me. <laughs> um, but uh, years later, uh, one of my best friends tried to take his life. He didn't try. He, he told me he was. So I knew there was a problem. So I, I said, you got to get your help. You gotta get you some help, you need to talk to somebody. So I went on the computer and I started looking up depression. And when I looked at all the symptoms, I had every one of them. That's, that's sort of ironic that I would have these, because I was really in denial, really, really, really was. But every, every um, uh, symptom that was on that uh, site, I had. And, and you know, time went on, and then in 2000, uh, one of my singers passed suddenly. Um, and it just sort of devastated me, de devastated my group. Uh, and there was a young lady who was a member of my church at the time who was a psychiatric nurse, a minister, and a licensed therapist. And she came into one of our rehearsals to talk to us about grief and the whole grieving process because all of us were so, you know, burdened about uh, the loss of, of, of uh, my singer, our friend, our family. And uh, that's how I sort of met her. That was really the person who would end up being my therapist. Um, and then right after that, I found out that the person the Smallwood brother, who I thought was my father all my life, was not my father. And uh, I found this right before, the song that you just heard, My Everything, I found that right before we recorded that. I found that out that he wasn't, I almost didn't go on stage that night. It, it was so devastating because everything you think you are, every, you're not. You're like, who am I? And my mother at that time was very, very ill. Her mind would go and come, and she would be really vague about it. So that sent me flying to therapy. And as I got to therapy to try to deal with that, all of the other stuff started coming out. Uh, and finally, my, 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 my therapist, after months and months of, of working on me, said, you know, Richard, you're clinically depressed. And... Uh, I didn't know what to do with that. I, I didn't want to tell anybody. Uh, I didn't even want anybody to know I was going to therapy because it was such a, a stigma kind of thing, especially in the black community. You don't go to therapy, you pray about it, you get up and you go about your merry way, God's gonna fix it. But the thing is, is that God gives doctors, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, that's ministry. People think that ministry can only be if you're behind a pulpit with a Bible. But that's ministry. God has given those people ministry to help those who need your help. So don't be afraid. The thing that I always say is reach out. Reach out to somebody. Don't be afraid. Find someone you can talk to. Find friends. Not everybody. But, but, but a key, maybe one or two, or maybe just one that you can talk to, that you can reach out to. The worst thing to do is shut down and not let anybody in. And that's so easy to do when you're really going through the throes of depression. After a while, uh, it got to the point where I couldn't record. I remember one year I was, I was uh, scheduled to record a record. I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. And I didn't want to tell the label because I was too embarrassed. So. Thankfully, one of the guys who worked with the label was a very good friend of mine as well. And he came uh, to DC 
and we went out to dinner. And I didn't tell him, but I think he sensed what the problem was. I did everything but really say it. And he said, Richard, you know what? We're going to take all of, the, all of the records that you've done, all the praise and worship songs that you've done, and make a praise and worship album so you don't even have to worry about doing one right now until you can, you can get yourself together, you know? But shortly after that, um, my, my therapist um, suggested that I go on meds, medication, which terrified me because I'd heard so many horror stories about it. Um, people walking around in a coma, doped up or like a zombie, you know, that, that kind of thing. And the, and the early kinds of, uh, uh, of medications were like that. Uh, I went to school with, um, with the late, great, 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 great Donnie Hathaway. And uh, we were at Howard University together. He was a senior when I was a freshman. And uh, when he was at Howard, he showed no signs of the, of the mental illness that came later. But uh, in talking to his, his, his wife, who's also in school with us, I found out that the medications that, uh, that they gave him, he didn't want to take because they were debilitating and they kept him from creating. But they don't have those kinds of meds. They have some good meds that will really help you through. I didn't know that, though. So it was about two or three months I prayed and said, oh God, let me make the right decision. And finally I started on my medication. Um, and probably about a month maybe, I had you know, some very minor side effects. But then I realized after the side effects went away that a lot was different. That, uh, and it didn't, it, it didn't affect my creativity. You know, it didn't get in the way of me composing or, or, or performing or ministering or anything. It didn't put me in some kind of stupor or some kind of daze. It was like depression was a, uh, a manhole. And that I would walk down the street and then I would fall into this dark well and I would stay and stay and stay and stay and stay. And, stay. and each time I stay, I stay longer. And I, but the, the, the meds was like somebody put uh, a transparent manhole cover over me. And I could walk over the depression. Although I saw it there, it didn't, it didn't envelop me, you know. And uh, I was on medication for uh, about eight years. Eight years, nine years. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I said that it's very uh, important that we couple uh, the therapy with prayer because we are dealing with not only the physical man, but we're also dealing with the spiritual man. And gratefully, I had a young lady who was a minister, who was my therapist, as well as trained in therapy. So I was being treated both ways, you know. I remember feeling, I remember her telling me one time, I felt so uh, convicted because I didn't really understand why I had it and, 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 and why God had given it to me. And, and I used to say, um, um, how can I get up? and sing about um, Jesus, you're the center of my joy, or I love the Lord, you heard my cry, or there's healing for your sorrow, healing for your pain, and then I leave the stage and I'm hurting, and I, I don't know how, I'm like, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm a liar. I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging all these people, but I'm lying because I messed up. And she said to me, she said, Richard, do you remember what the Lord told Paul? And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, Paul had a thorn in his side. And God told him, my grace is sufficient. So I'm glad I had, I had a, a therapist who knew the Lord. So she, she could minister not only to me in terms of, of the medications and the therapy, but she could also minister to me in terms of the spiritual man. Uh, one day, um, I couldn't find my psychiatrist, the guy who actually um, 
dispense the medication, who also suffered with depression. Uh, and he would sometimes just sort of disappear. And he disappeared this time, and I was like, oh my God, I, don't, I can't take, I don't have no medication, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? And God just sort of spoke to me and said, I got this. And uh, I said, and you're not supposed to stop cold turkey. I mean, you're supposed to gradually, you know, but I didn't have anything to get, so I was like, God, this is just me and you, and I just stopped. And I haven't been on it since. That was 2010. And uh, don't get me wrong, you know, I have my little bouts, and I go to my therapist and I get what I call tune-ups. Uh, there's sometimes there are things that will bring it on. There are life circumstances that will bring it on. Uh, and I have to, and then sometimes it's just the time of season, like Christmas, uh, when my mom died December 1st of 2005, you know, all those kinds of things sometimes will sort of make it uh, uh, happen. Uh, so I know when those times happen, and I call my, my therapist, I listen, I need to tune up. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about this. And thank God she has helped me in ways that I could not uh, even explain or articulate to you. I know that she is a godsend. And uh, I mean, I've, I've been to the point where, one of the good things is that I don't like pain. So uh, I, I don't like any kind of pain at all. Just give me a, a, a leave or a Tylenol or, I had, I had total hip replacement about four years ago. And so, give me some Vicodin, or, uh, you know what I'm saying? And don't get me wrong, I'm not depending on none of that, but I'm just saying I don't like pain. But I remember one time it got so bad that I really went on the internet and began to search uh, how to take my life without it hurting. And uh, so I know for a fact that um, she is a godsend, and that's why I say to anybody who's dealing with any kind of, of depression or anxiety, because usually they go hand in hand, the anxiety and the depression, um, go get help. Go get help. Please, please go get help. I, mean, but I, I look at people like uh, you know, Robin Williams and, and, and other people who are so gifted and, and one thing I always say, you know, when I see God, I'm going to ask him about the whole creative thing and depression. Well, how, what is that about? You know, I, I look at, you know, Donnie Hathaway and, and others who have, you know, who, who have battled with stuff. It seems like the more creative sometimes, the worse the depression. I'm not sure why that is, you know. But uh, I, 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 I'm glad I went through this. Uh, and one of the reasons, I always say this, I say, when we go through things in our lives, when we go through what I call valid situations in our lives, they're for two reasons. Number one, they're to help us to grow. They're to mature us, to make us stronger. The other reason is to help other people. Because you can't help, I cannot tell you anything about depression other than what I read if I haven't gone through it. When my, before my mother passed, I had plenty of people, friends whose mothers had passed. And I said, oh, I know how you feel. No, I didn't. It wasn't until my mama passed that I understood. So a lot of times you have to go through that thing in order to minister and to help people effectively. Um, the Washington Post did an article um, last year on, on me and the whole thing with, with the depression. And I cannot tell you the email, the texts, uh, people stopping me in the street, people stopping me at a red light while I'm in the car, people stopping me at church saying, thank you for being transparent because this is helping me. And so it, it, God sort of made it a little more obvious and clearer to me why it was that I was dealing with this. Because ministry sometimes 
extends beyond what we think our ministries are. You know, for me, okay, yeah, I write and I, I you know, I even preach, but sometimes God stretches us to take us to other places so we can help other people. And that's what it's all about. It's about helping others. So, uh, you know, it has not been an easy road, but certainly I'm grateful for it because as the old hymn says, if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. So uh, it, 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 as, we, as we grow and as we mature, God reveals even more to us what our purposes are. We're all here for a purpose. We're all preordained to do certain things. Uh, and it may not come in your, in your 20s or your 30s, it may come later. But God will open the doors and, and, and create the pathway so that you can uh, walk in your purpose. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to open the doors for the doors of the church. <laughs> you would set up a church board. Uh, I'm going to open the floor for any questions that uh, you may have. We'll take a few questions here. Okay. We're doing our exercise, so meet me halfway. I just more so have a comment. Um, I just thank you for sharing your story. You are one of the reasons why I even came to this conference. Because I am a licensed therapist. I've been um, in practice for about 20 years. I make work majorly with college students. But God has allowed me to work in my church in the Biblical Counselor's Ministry. And uh, what I have been doing here lately, God has just opened up doors to, to show me what the need is. So I created a talk called um, Arise and Renew Your Mind. Because we had a family conference. And you know how if you say depression, if you put depression in the title, they won't come. <laughs> so I said Arise and Renew Your Mind. And after the people came, we just had a candid discussion about depression. And the same thing that you said, sometimes we as Christians have to realize that there are resources beyond prayer. Yes. Um, it's okay to have a therapist. Mm -hmm. It's okay to have to see a doctor to take medication. Your healing may come multifaceted. And it may not just be through laying at the hands of prayer. And I just want the church to, all of those that are involved in your health ministries, to think about adding that component to the health ministry. Because a lot of time we, the mind kind of goes to the side when it comes to psychological disorders because of the stigma. But in, in, in saying all of that, I'm just saying, saying doing that one talk has opened the door for me to go speak at other churches. So now people are coming to me to say, hey, can you come talk? And so I really feel like God is leading me to do some other things with the gifts that he has blessed me with. So thank you for, for just bringing up this topic. God bless you. Thank you. My name is Marcia Henderson, and I went to Howard University yes. from 1967 to 1971. Oh, you were there when I was there. And we used to yes. always be so proud of you. Oh, we so would talk you. about the gospel choir and that Richard Small. Oh. And we knew that you were a star. It was just a moment, a minute that if everyone would know what we already knew. Oh, thank you. And I have to say, depression in black men is yes. a huge problem. Yeah. And the fact that you are willing to do this, you've come 360, we are yet again always proud of our darling Richard Smallwood Thank coming you. to talk with us and saving us with your song and now with your experience. And so thank you so much for that. Barbara Hutchinson, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your, your candor and transparency. I, you know, I'm also a musician, and sometimes at the end of my busy day when I get home, uh, music is what I use to what I call wind down. And so I wanted to find out in your state of depression, uh, did you find music, any kind of therapy then at all? Or was it more, you were so depressed you didn't even want to do or go to the keyboard? 
I just wanted to know how, in, in your state of depression, how did music play a part? For the majority of the time, I, I didn't want to do music myself. I didn't want to play, I didn't want to sing, I didn't want to do anything. But I loved listening to classical music because that would sort of soothe me. And, and uh, so if anything was on, if any kind of anything music was on, it would be definitely classical music, which, which I sort of grew up on. I grew up on classical and gospel, so um, that was sort of my, my soothing kind of thing that happened. Here we have a question here. CDC has recently released a report that says young black children who go through the regular rigors of just existing often suffer from post-traumatic stress. And there's nothing in the school system, there's no monies to get them treated. There's no monies to put aside to make sure that they thrive in the system. So my concern is if, and, and I, it's not necessarily for you, it may be for the, for the psychologist over here or someone that could tell me, what do we do with our children when they're going through such trauma? This is why young men, why young black men have more depression than others, but is there an answer? I, I don't know. Um, um, are you in the school system, your teacher? Public health, okay. Maybe someone in that area can, yes, yes. Give you credentials. Praise the Lord. I have a doctorate in clinical psychologist, and I am from Apostolic Faith Church. My pastor is Dr. Horace Smith. And um, there's a lot of things going on with mental health now in our school system. It's really bad. The resources are not there, but so we have to continue to fight for the resources uh, to have them put in our schools. We're the last to get the resources. So you as pastors, doctors, we have to go back into the community just like we're doing today to get the word out until we can get those resources back into our community. Actually, I have been a public school teacher for the last 30 plus years. As a, as a high school guidance counselor, and I have seen the deterioration of our young people because we are not in community, we are not in family, and we do not support them. If we continue to support from the grassroots up, teaching our children, bringing them back to family, some of it will dissipate. However, while this work needs to be done, it's not going to be funded yet. So we have to get back into the community and, and help. Amen. Amen. There's a question over here. <coughs> On me. Well, God bless you, Brother Richard. Uh, I'm encouraged, I really am. It's always encouraging to hear men talk about their experience. And I, I believe my question to you would be, do you, to this day, still know why you were depressed? And the reason why I'm asking is because I grew up in a home where my father was an alcoholic, mm -hmm. and he was a violent alcoholic. And it wasn't unusual for my father if we didn't let him in the house to threaten to kill us. Mm -hmm. You know, but I remember this, but when I gave my life to Christ, one of the things that the Lord said to me is that, you can no longer run from your problems, now you gotta face them, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so that took me on a journey where I began to really assess not only the choices that I was making, but some of the things that was happening to me because of what my father did. And, uh, and I'll never forget this, when my father finally passed away and I had to do his eulogy, one of the final words that the Lord put in my, my sermon was, uh, it would be a shame to allow a dead man to still have power over you. So uh, the reason, so again, my question to you is that to this day, do you know why you are depressed? Because a lot of times with musicians, sometimes they struggle with immorality or there's other things they struggle with or sometimes it's loneliness or whatever it is. But I'm just kind of curious to this day, do you know what caused that? I think a lot of mine was genetic, is genetic. 
um, because as I said earlier, my, my, uh, my grandfather committed suicide. My mother had depression problems. I never knew about it until she got much, much older. Uh, and as I began to talk about my struggle within my family, other family members uh, came forward to say, well, you know, I struggle with anxiety and I struggle with, so I think um, a lot of it uh, has to do with uh, genetics uh, and DNA. Certainly, I think some of it had to do with my father. Uh, I'm still working through uh, feelings uh, of, uh, of resentment from him because I wasn't his uh, and the violent kinds of uh, things that he would do. Um, that's why I'm still in therapy. <laughs> um, but uh, but, I, but I, I do think the majority of mine has a lot to do with, with genetics. We have time for just a couple more questions. We have a question here in the back. Again, uh, my name is Lonnie Cowan. I am from the Chronic Pain Support Group in Central Kentucky. And what I want to emphasize and I want you to explain we have a lot of people that is suffering from anxiety and depression. And most of the time, people can hear your music and song, but you've been very instrumental from your records. And you can just listen to that, the spirit, and, and you feel the warmth of Jesus. And it gives you inspiration to go forward. You know, I too had suffered from depression from medication. And I didn't even know that I was going to go through, but listening to your, your music and your songs, it uplifted me somewhat. So I do know that medication sometimes can be the answer, but sometimes the word of God and music can be, make a difference. And sometimes we have to walk in situations that we do not want to, to go through it, to come out. And that's what you have done. God wanted you to go there. How can you explain to someone else and you had not gone through it? So I just want you to know you have been a wonderful inspiration to so many people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm not sure how much time. Do we have time for? Okay, for one more question. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Smallwood. I'm so glad also to be here. Um, I'm in Miami, and your song um, about the healing for your pain um, is our theme song for our bereavement support groups. I run a, a faith-based support group um, in Miami. We have 70 uh, groups uh, around the uh, Miami-Dade County and Broward County to help people that have suffered all types of losses, not just the death of a loved one. And that's where we see a lot of depression as well in our community. And so the grief support groups is, you know, like a handout, an outreach to those sometimes who cannot afford a therapist or counseling. A lot of our people don't or can't. They don't have insurance. So I thank you so much for being here today and addressing this. Um, we call it the code of silence, not just stigma, but the code of silence in the church and also to give it a name. And I hope this is something that can get out to our faith-based community and become something nationally that people are gonna address, like you said, like any other illness, and it's the risk factors has to do with the prevailing social determinants of health, as well as the health disparities we see in our underserved communities. So thank you so much. I wanted to thank you because your song is our theme song, even for our service of remembrance that we do once a year. We have the liturgical dancers to uh, do it uh, to lift up the people. And I just want to put a plug in. I'm gonna be presenting on PTSD uh, tomorrow at the workshop PTSD and gun violence. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your bravery and thank you for your questions. God bless you, Minister Smalley.